Okay, so recording has start, so we're, I mean, it started, so we're going to start. It's 6.06 .06 on Thursday, October 22nd, 2020. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our maiden edition, Let's Talk Virtual Series. Uh, before I start, I would actually love everyone to please indulge me because I want to talk about my country, Nigeria, just for one minute. There's a lot going on right now. Um, the, the giant of Africa is not so giant right now. People are dying, our youths are protesting, and uh, there's no support. So I would just want us one minute silence because a lot has fallen since they started the protest till now. A lot is going on. Just one minute silence and we will continue. Thank you for your indulgence. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. So what is the agenda today? Uh, Councilor Nissen, I saw your email very late and so I was not able to respond, my apologies. Uh, but this is the agenda. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do is to introduce uh, African Caribbean Council of Alton, welcome community leaders and our counselors. And then we'll quickly introduce, we'll get the board members to introduce themselves. And we will get uh, Christine to talk about our vision and mission. What is it that we do? What is it that we stand for? And then we have a few questions uh, that, that ranges around uh, how can we be successful in becoming politicians? Because if something is happening in a country that we live in and we don't know how to do it as a people, um, if we don't have someone to speak for us on the table, and we know that you wonderful people will be speaking for us, but it's always good to see somebody like us also on the table. So we wanna ask questions around that. So why did we decide, so I'm gonna go into the introduction. So why did we decide to have less talk? We know that there's been a lot of things happening. Uh, I mean, COVID-19 has not stopped, it's evolving, it's the Colin novel. It keeps changing all the time. And of course, we talked about Black Lives Matter. And uh, so, and of course, we're seeing the second wave of COVID. And, uh, you know, we know that Canada is a country of diversity and inclusion. We're just looking for ways to make sure that, yes, uh, Canada can actually stand tall uh, uh, to what it calls it himself to be, itself to be. And uh, we know there's a lot of diversity, but we would like to see some more inclusion. And so we started, uh, we decided to do this Let's Talk series. And so uh, it's, it's a way to continue the dialogue. Uh, with elected members like yourselves. We'll be inviting different people uh, on a monthly basis and also business organizations because we know that when we're looking for change, change actually starts with each and every one of us. Uh, it's what we're doing individually, personally, that really will make that change happen. So, and that's basically what it is. So understanding the, I mean, so this, the topic today will be understanding the political terrain. And, uh, and that's why we have you, you find people with us. So uh, on that note, I'm just quickly going to um, talk about who we have. Um, Councillor Samira Ali and uh, Councillor Rory Nissan quickly uh, do some introduction. And then we'll go uh, to the board. And then we'll give you time to talk to us about, you know, a little bit more because we know that the bio doesn't necessarily tell all the stories. So we'll, we'll get the inside scoop from you. So who is, uh, I'm going to start with the lady because I'm a lady. <laughs> so Councillor Samara Ali, she's a local councillor for Ward 4, which is the southwest area of Milton. And also the fastest growing ward in, in the fastest growing town in Ontario. 
Being a global citizen with international life experiences, Samira is the perfect representation of Milton's most diverse world. Samira's passion for volunteering in the community has given her the insight and understanding needed. I'm just gonna admit this person has given her the insights and understanding needed to fill in the gaps and build bridges in our town. Issues related to youth, poverty reduction, and senior continues to be our focus. And as such, she sits on the Milton Youth Task Force. She is the PR officer for the Milton Legion and the community director for Milton Alal Food Bank. Samira holds a master's degree in international relations and PR, and professionally, she has had over 15 years of experience in managing multilingual uh, PR and marketing campaigns for clients all over the world. Currently, she resides in Wilmot neighborhood of Ward 4 with her loving husband and four beautiful children. So please welcome Councillor Samira Ali. Thank you so much for welcoming me. Thank, Thank you, you for so much, Adiji Sola. That is a beautiful introduction. Thank you. Well, that's me in a nutshell, and I'm so happy to be here. First of all, thank you for giving me the honor to be here and to share my story. Um, my story is a story of volunteerism. So if you ask me, Samira, well, how can I become a politician? My answer is just volunteer. Because unless and until you volunteer in your community and you attach yourself to the, the heartbeat of the community, the heartbeat of the community are the nonprofit organizations that keep us going. That is the root and the basis of any Canadian society in any town in Milton, in any city in Milton. Once you attach yourself to the heartbeat of your local community, you will get to know about the grassroots issues and problems. And that's where you can use that knowledge to knock on doors, to talk about those things, and to garner support if you're running for office. And having said that, you also need to know that different levels of government have different um, election strategies, um, have their own different pros and cons. So for example, if you're a municipal councilor and you're running for council, you, you it's a non-partisan role. So you have to run on your own capabilities as an individual and you have to sell yourself, so to speak, at every single door. There is no party platform backing you or pushing you forward. Uh, so that's uh, that's a little bit about what we're gonna discuss later on. So I'm just giving you a little sneak peek into that. I know this, this portion is for me to introduce myself. So Adiji Sola told you all about me. I, I got involved in politics around 10 years ago as a volunteer and built my way up into the political arena as well, working with a lot of candidates, learning about the processes. I'm an immigrant like many of you here. I wasn't born here, I moved here. Um, and then I wanted, I was interested in the political process. So to learn the political process, I started volunteering with different campaigns. And that's how I learned how the system works. And uh, when you volunteer enough and you know the issues enough and you start talking about it and it starts making sense to people, people are the ones who reached out to you and say, you know what, you should run and you should represent us. So that's how it worked out for me too. And I'm here to answer any questions you guys might have. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that short and sweet intro. And so to Councillor Rory Nissen, who is actually, I'm sorry, uh, Councillor Ali is actually my favorite councillor. <laughs> Rory is a career foreign service officer who has represented Canada internationally since 2007. He has negotiated human rights resolutions at the United Nations supported the North Atlantic Treaty organizations and worked for the protection of civic space through the community of democracies. Democracies. He has also specialized in measuring international instability and helped Canadians in the aftermath of natural and man-made disasters during, including bringing Syrian refugees to Canada in 2015 and 2016. Rory grew up in Brant Hills in Burlington and has been active in the community since returning home, co-creating and chairing the One Burlington Festival in 2017 and 2018, opposing the closure of Lester B. Pearson High School and connecting Burlington to the world through 
Mondialization Committee. Rory's local efforts were acknowledged with a Burlington 150 Award in 2017, a nomination for the Burlington's Best Community Service Award the same year. Rory enjoys spending time with friends and family, especially his partner, Karina, and traveling whenever he can. So, welcome, Councillor Rory Neeson. <laughs> Let me just say he's my favorite counselor too. Oh, come on. Y'all always know how to make a blush. That's the real goal. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lady Abba, for the uh, for the introduction. Um, so I just talk uh, I'll try to fill in some of the blanks in the uh, in that uh, intro and then we could maybe talk about the substance uh, after that to, to the main question. So you know, I was always interested in politics growing up. I was interested in history as well. So when I went to university, I studied political science and, uh, and history as a minor. But I always thought that, um, that running for office was for people in the know, insiders, um, maybe the kids of, of uh, politicians or people who knew people. And it was a bit of a black box for me. So rather than um, dive in, uh, which I said I could have, well, I focused more on the international uh, realm um, because I thought that that was, the, that was the biggest form of all, right? So if you want to make change and positive change, then you go to the biggest forum out there and try to, try to make a difference there. Um, and so uh, that's what eventually drew me into the um, into the Canadian uh, Foreign Service, and uh, and did some of the things that you already mentioned. Um, and it was uh, at times a very uh, rewarding career, but um, eventually you realize, uh, as someone who wants to make change, I expect that probably everybody on this um, on this uh, Google Meetup. Um, want to make change in their community and that's the one reason why you're here well eventually I, I came to realize that you you need to make the most difference through marginal change and what i mean by that is if you disappear tomorrow would someone be there to take your place and would there be would there be no difference at all or can you make can you go somewhere where your skills and your enthusiasm can make the most change and you would be hard to replace so I thought, rather than being one part of a really big machine, which is the federal government uh, and the Foreign Service, where there are lots of other enthusiastic people who could take over for me, that I would try running for office where one person really can make um, a big difference you, with the force of their personality, their enthusiasm, their intelligence, uh, and their determination. So that's what really drew me to uh, run um, office and the first time I actually ran for a uh, for a nomination in a federal election and I did it with very little preparation um, not much consideration of the consequences I just knew I wanted to do it and that's the kind of confidence that um, that that some people can have and that's one that, that I have uh, and and I owe that in large part to being a white uh, male and the privilege that comes along with that. Um, that would put you, put one in a position where they think that they could come from nowhere and, uh, and run for office. The trick is anybody can do that. Now I lost, to be clear. Um, uh, so uh, when 2018 uh, came around and I returned uh, back to Burlington at that point, I did, uh, I did a little bit more homework and talked to a lot of the veterans um, and they share a lot of the wisdom that I hope I can share tonight as well about uh, running for office uh, locally. And uh, I knocked on those doors and I knocked on around 15,000 uh, doors. Um, and uh, that uh, helped me to win. But I will say just one more thing, which is that something that I, that I experienced, and it is a drop in the bucket, for again, a, uh, a white uh, male coming from that privilege. But uh, something I experienced at the door several times a day was the comment, oh, you're so young. 
You're ready to run. You want to run for office at your age? How old are you? You want to run? Okay. You know, so I, um, I would receive that maybe anywhere from three to 10 times per day for six months. Um, now, I can't emphasize enough that, that I, I think that I still benefited from, from very much from the, from the privilege that I have. Uh, but uh, each of those, and I don't know if, if you know what I mean, but each of those was like a paper cut, right? Uh, each time. So that was my experience running for, running for office. Uh, there was tons of support as well. And so we can go into more detail about that. And so that's what got me to the position I am in today. Thank you so very much. Thank you again uh, for joining us today. So I'm going to pass it on to um, um, our board members. But we do have some community leaders here that I just want to quickly recognize. Um, Evangeline Chima is a community leader, but she's also a board. She'll, so she will fall under the board for today. But I will like to uh, recognize um, Mr. Andrew is amazing. So if you don't mind just uh, speaking for, it's also part of our advisory group, so uh, uh, advisory board. So if you'll please uh, just you know, take a moment or two to talk to us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Adeji uh, um, I just want to um, welcome Councillor Samira and uh, Rory, we're delighted to, to welcome you to have you in our presence today. So we're really excited to, to learn and uh, share your story. We, we're excited that you're sharing your stories with us and uh, for enabling us with knowledge. And uh, hopefully we can get inspiration from uh, people like you. Um, and um, thank you for, for, for your service to the community. Thank you so much, sir. So I'm going to pass it on to um, our board. I will start with you, uh, Ms. Evangeline Chima, to start us off. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you, um, counselors. I really appreciate you guys coming today to talk to us. Um, I'll start briefly. Professional background. I have a master's in information technology services. And I've uh, been lucky to work for a lot of organizations uh, and over the uh, past 17 years, worked in the capacity of a project manager, senior business analyst, business consultant, et cetera. Um, I'm currently the president of two grassroots organizations, and I'm also uh, the founder and executive director of Black Mentorship Inc. Imagine always being the lone face in a management room Imagine um, not being uh, able to advance in your career profession. This is, uh, these are one of the reasons why Black Mentorship was founded to provide leadership training and um, to advance the Black community. Now, when we look at ACCH, and look at our community halting. I've been in halting for over 11 years. We always feel like we're invisible. And this is something that we want to start because we are indeed a community, a community that has ideas, a community that has dreams, a community that has needs just like everyone else. And what we are hoping to achieve through our work with African Caribbean Council Halting is to advocate for the Black community so that we can have a seat at that decision table. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Evangeline. Uh, Mr. Abe Salami, over to you, sir. Can you hear me now? Thank you, everybody, for coming. And especially thank you, um, Councillor Rory and Councillor Samira. Thank you very much for being our miss today. Um, in a nutshell, my name is Abi Salami, and I'm a project management professional 
and I've been living in Houghton region uh, for 12 years. Um, of course, I migrated from Nigeria and I happened to be involved in the politics in Nigeria as well before. I mean, now that everything is going upside down, so we hope that whatever we're going to discuss today, we we'll learn and it's going to impact us first in this community so that uh, we we'll live as um, human beings and we understand each other so we coexist positively in our community and make our community better. And um, so that is going to sp uh, spread over and wherever everybody comes from, then we will enjoy the dividend of democracy. So um, once more, um, thank you very much for being our miss and you're welcome. So <laughs> we take you from there. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So over to you, Christine. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, thanks to everybody that has joined um, the call as well as a special thanks to our counselors. Um, so I am Kristen. I am Canadian born. I, I was uh, born in Burlington, raised in Hamilton, now living in Milton. Been here about eight, nine years. <laughs> You've converted me over. <laughs> um, yeah, so professionally, uh, I work for an, a corporation called uh, Eaton Industries. I've been there 22 uh, years, so I started when I was three, and uh, <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> but um, so I've I've worn more many hats uh, throughout my career, and uh, just recently took over um, our customer service uh, department. So I run the department there, and. Um, also at the corporation, um, I also lead two ERGs, so Eaton Resource or Employee Resource Groups, one for the advancement of women in the electrical um, industry, and the other uh, for um, is called BIPOC, and it's um, the advancement and awareness of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And um, it's something I'm very passionate about. I'm grateful and thankful that uh, I found ACCH and um, really looking forward to building with um, elected officials like yourselves to make change. Thank you very much, Kristen. Because we are not that many, I would love to get everyone here to introduce themselves. And so I see Mr. Eddie Adebote. Mr. Adebote, do you mind uh, spending 30 seconds to one minute to quickly introduce yourself to us? Mr. Adebote, are you there? Yes, uh, th thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm actually in a store, so it's, it's a bit, uh, uh, I'm trying to stay somewhere that uh, is quiet so that I can talk. Uh, I'm listening, I mean, listening more than I'm taking in a quite a lot of information. Uh, my background is in product marketing, and um, I'm also, you know, interested in how we can, you know, help the community. Um, I like what uh, uh, Samira said in terms of volunteering, and I'm looking forward to learn how we can actually use that effectively. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, short and sweet. Um, Emmanuel Okorafo, do you mind introducing yourself to us? Hi, my name is Emmanuel Okorafo. I am part of um, ACCH's digital marketing and also their engagement. I have, I'm looking forward to what's going on, what's going to be discussed about today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I know that... Uh, I'm not sure if you want to talk, but I know my husband is also online. This is his number, I know it for sure. So, Mr. Tunde, do you mind talking to us? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tunde Dimeji, and I live here in Austin. Uh, I'm from Florida. Awesome. Part of the batch, you can see that I'm the speaker for the family. <laughs> I'm the loud one. So, okay. So I do see another number. I don't see a name. So if you don't mind telling us who you are.
Hello? The number starts with 613 and ends with 28. Do you mind introducing yourself, please? Okay, I guess we're going to move on, and uh, if they do um, connect properly, maybe we'll get them to introduce themselves. So thank you, everybody, for the introduction. It's really nice to know everybody that is here since we're not so many. I just want to quickly touch on a few things that um, some of us talked about. Some of us talked about invisibility, um, exclusivity, and um, being left behind, not seen. And when all that happens, Yes, we as individuals, we lose. But most importantly, our community loses much more. Because basically what is happening is we're leaving people with skills, experience, education, we're leaving them behind, people that could add a lot of value to the community, whether it is Alton in particular or Canada in general. And that's why I'm happy that everybody is open to inclusiveness. So thank you again. And before I hand it over to Christine, I just want to quickly talk about an upcoming event, which is happening November 21st, 2020. It is the launch of African Caribbean Council of Alton. That's when we'll let everybody know we're here. Yes, yes. <laughs> and it's going to happen at the Burlington Performing Arts Center. Uh, the time is two to five. We're working on the flyer. We will get it out as soon as possible. And I also want to use this opportunity to say thank you to Councillor uh, Rory Nissen. You have been amazing with our planning. He made it possible for us to get that location, and it is free of charge to us. It made us realize that there's a loan, I mean, there's a grant that we can apply to, and we're going to be using that grant to support our celebration. We cannot thank you enough. You've been an amazing Highlight. Thank you so much. And so, <laughs> yes. And, you know, we thank you so that you think of other things you're going to do. Okay. Not just thanking you for, <laughs> for what you need more. And then now that we're thanking you, we know that uh, Councillor Ali will be thinking of, oh, what can I do for ACCH now? So, yeah, there you go. Now I'm going to hand it over to Christine to talk to us about what we stand for, who we really are. Over to you, Christine. Great, thank you for that. Uh, so, so who are we? So ACCH, um, African Caribbean Council of Halton, and our vision is to advocate, build, empower, and strengthen our community. Uh, we aim to elevate, build, and advocate for an inclusive and equitable African Caribbean community in Halton by advancing our culture, socioeconomic, political, educational, and professional empowerment. And our impact of ACCH will be to advocate to elected officials such, such as yourselves, um, organizations and businesses on programs and policies that affect our community for meaningful and tangible change. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So uh, we will be going to the Q&A, but I just have a couple of questions that I want to throw out to either Councillor Newton or uh, Councillor uh, Samira. So uh, the question is, okay. So the question is, I think you kind of alluded to it a little, but we want to know, how did you get here? So flesh it out a little for us. You have about two to three minutes. Flesh it out. Let's let's know the process. I know somebody said volunteering. Somebody said, you know, just, you know, supporting people in the community. You know, let's understand more how you got here. And that can be answered by either of you. Thanks, Rory. And uh, yeah, that's a great question. How I got here as a counselor is uh, basically, like I said before, when you start uh, being active in your community and, and you understand the issues and you start talking about them and not just talking about them, but you have solutions too, you will start seeing a narrative build around you where people are saying, you know, you should run or you you can see that you know there are some gaps that you are qualified to fill in and um you know rory was talking about that too about making change and making change in a big way so yes i i 100 percent second what he just said so make so so just finding that drive within yourself and then you know having that passion to make change and then 
that combined with your work as a volunteer and your understanding of the local issues uh, is, is what helps you get there. And so that's how I got here. Uh, personally, I, I uh, was doing that for years in Milton. And uh, people around me, my friends start saying you should run. And so when the council uh, elections opened up, I took a look around because you also have to be realistic. You also have to run for positions that you know are achievable. And uh, you have got to do your math. You have to understand how how powerful you are, what your strengths are, how strong your network is. And once you do those calculations and you see a possibility of you winning, you just jump in, uh, go in, uh, pick out those papers, fill them up and uh, just submit them. That's it. And that's how I'm here. I just ran for election. When I ran for election, there were five people who ran in this ward. Uh, and uh, it was four gentlemen and uh, myself. So, and I was the only woman running. And I was, uh, and I and I did not run. I not at one single door. I said, "Hey, I am the only woman running. Vote for me." No, I said, "I am the most qualified candidate. Vote for me." And that is what my advice will be for all the females who are listening to me, especially females of color. You don't have to go to the door and say, hey, look at me. I'm a woman of color and the only female. When they look at your face, they see that right away. You don't have to say it, but you have to run on the basis of your qualifications, on the basis of your network and connections, and you do your math like anybody else. And if you really feel that you are the best candidate and that you are the most qualified candidate, go for it because nobody can represent your community better than you. Thank you very much. I do have a follow-up question to that. You mentioned mm -hmm. you volunteered for some time. Now, yeah. we all know that when you're volunteering, money is not paid to you. So no. how did you survive? Because we, I mean, a lot of us come in trying to look for a job. We, at times, all of, some of us take on survival jobs just because we need to make hands meet. There's some bills we pay here that we don't pay back home. So how can we navigate that? How do we, you know, pay our bills and still volunteer without getting paid? So wow. that's a very good question. And the answer to that question is that see what moves you and what you're passionate about and only go for that. If you're someone who's really busy and you know it's hard to make ends meet and like any other immigrant, I know the whole fallacy of Canadian experience. I've been through it myself. Wow. You come in here as a highly qualified individual with 20 years of experience under your belt the first thing you hear is, sorry, you're overqualified or we can't hire you because you don't have Canadian experience. Hey, I just got here. <laughs> How can I gain that Canadian experience? The answer is, again, volunteer. When you volunteer, even if it's in a voluntary position, you are actually gaining Canadian experience. And that you can use to put on your resume and really does add value and weight to your resume. So... So if you're a busy person, for example, you're passionate about seniors issue and that touches your heart, the key is to in, get involved in an issue that touches your heart because then, then you don't need any payment for that. It's the passion that will draw you in and then you'll get up even if it's early morning, 7 a.m., you got to show up just to put on a West and direct traffic. You'll do it because you're passionate about that cause. So that's the key. And when you have that passion, and people say thank you to you and you make a difference you don't even feel the need to get paid for it thank you so much uh before i pass it on to your counselor or Nisa, to see if you have anything you want to add to that but um so i just want to make sure i'm hearing you right uh so when you volunteer you're you're kind of saying you can work on one hand and then volunteer on the other and create create time to do both and get experience for, uh, you know, getting whatever you, you want to do, your professional qualification. Okay. Yes. So like my husband, I'll give you the example of my husband. My husband is a full-time employee in his work, and but he's very passionate about immigrant issues. So what he does on the weekends is that he provides mentorship and resume critique to new immigrants. And Good. so it's not it's not something where he has to go in and show up. Sometimes they do workshops and then he shows up, but other times he just gets submission online and he can just dedicate an hour or two of 
office Sunday, sit down and critique those resumes and send them back in and help someone get a job. So that's the kind of little opportunities you can find within the community that align with your schedule and your interests. Thank you so very much. So, uh, Christine, please note it down. Whenever we want to do anything around resumes and interview skills, we know where to go. So, <laughs> over to you, Councillor Horinis, and do you have anything you want to add to that? Sure, and I just want to say, Lady, I was not joking. I'll probably be in touch with you next week, Samira, about that. Um, maybe follow up. <laughs> So, you know what, this is, yeah, Samara gave a great summary. I, I think that, um, first of all, if uh, Samira can make time with four kids, um, then uh, yes, it just shows it can, uh, it can in fact uh, be done, uh, the volunteering. Now, I'm not, I, I don't think it's an absolute must. Are you guys able to hear me right now? Okay. So, I was gonna say, I don't know if it's me. Is it cracking though? Seems like it's cracking. I'm gonna just switch over my Wi-Fi. Okay now. Here. Okay now. Yes. Okay now. Okay, I'm gonna switch over my my Wi-Fi. Should be better. Okay. Just stop me if uh, if you're having trouble hearing me. Uh, right. So you know, I think I do think that volunteering is very important. I don't think it's. I don't think you must. If you want to be involved in, um, uh, if you want to run for office, that you must volunteer first. Uh, but I do believe that it creates a momentum for for you in your local community. So it is very, it is important. Um, the truth is, the say the more you uh, the more you invest in your community before you run for office, the uh, easier your time is going to be, and the more likely that those doors will open for you. Uh, building a team around you, building a passion for your community, will all come through with that. Doesn't mean it's absolutely absolutely required, but the truth is that if you are very busy, understandably, with your work and your family and, and everything else, you will eventually need to make time to run for office because that isn't a paid position either. So that will happen, and the depending on your preparation, that could be a six month, eight month, a 12 month project in your evenings and weekends, um, if not more. So that was what I wanted to add on to the question of uh, volunteer. Thank you so very much. Uh, before I move on. Uh, but I have an end, like I have to say something to that. Sorry to, sorry to uh, stop. Rory, my my uh, perception is uh, is as an immigrant. So as an immigrant, I feel adding volunteerism to your resume is very important um, to pe to for people to take you as someone who is part of the the broader society, because us immigrants have a lot of um, preconceived notions within our own communities as well. So I think volunteering in the broader community helps with that. So so I agree 100% with what you said, but I'm just saying it, it came from a perspective of being an immigrant. And, and I would just add to that, uh, talking about volunteering, I'm actually a volunteer geek. Um, I do a lot in the community and believe you, me, again, these are some of the things we face. These are some of the things that we got to do to put our face out there, to even show our skills. Uh, so I volunteer with Junior Achievement. I volunteer with TRIEC. You know, I'm an, uh, 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 I'm an ambassador with Algoma University. I, I, I put myself out there to show them, you know what? If you're not giving me the job I deserve, you're losing. So that's the way we kind of present ourselves. Again, it comes with the territory of being an immigrant and being a beautiful, exotic young woman like me. So if I'm not talking about myself, nobody's gonna do it for me. So that's some of the things we kind of go through. But believe you me, even though it's not, um, it's not too fun, but we're gaining. We're gaining experiences. We're we're getting to understand the culture of Canada. We're going to we're we're understanding the social norms because if you don't put volunteering on your resume, to 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 Councillor Ali's point, people may not look at you. 
So yes, uh, volunteering is really, really key for us in the community. And so we need to continue to sound that trumpet so that people can use it as a stepping stone in getting a job in their profession. So um, do we have anyone that wants to have ask any questions around this before we move to the next question and we open it up for questions? Yes, I do have a question. Um, and this is for Councillor Samira. Um, she talked about um, your doing the math um, network, your network, um, in terms of obviously assessing your, uh, uh, what's it called, assessing your the the fact that you could win. You know, there's no doubt you you believe in your capabilities, but you talked about your network. You you assess it. What could that? What would that be? Is it the number of people you know, or what? What exactly do you mean by that? Yes. So, and, and Rory can pitch in uh, anytime. We can talk team out a little bit because we what what that really meant was your political strategy. So, whenever uh, thank you for the question, Andrew. By the way, so whenever you're running for any position, you have to do your SWOT analysis, which your strengths and your weaknesses analysis. And when you talk about the network, it means that there there's the there's the yeses, there's the nos, and then there's the maybes. And then there's also the most likelies. So you have to do that analysis. And that is what I mean when you when you kind of do the math and understand your network. There's the one, two, and three. So one is the one person who's gonna, gonna yes vote for you 100 percent The two is the person who has not decided yet. And three is who doesn't want to vote for you. So when you assess your network is A, yes, how many people are in your network, but then also understanding that not everybody in that network will be a voter because they're, they might be friends with some other candidate who's running, right? So when you see the full picture of who's running, you need to understand your network. Uh, sometimes people make the mistake of, you know, taking one person as a one family. And they say, okay, you know, I'm just going to double it or triple it because there's at least three people in the family. And that's three votes. But it turns out in the end, it's just one vote. So uh, do a very factual, uh, you know, analysis of your network. And I know all about this because right now I'm in the middle of a campaign. I have an election coming up on October 29th. So I'm speaking from very fresh experience. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Any other question before we move on to and Roy might have in. more to add. Yeah, I can jump in on that. Uh, I always seem to have something to say. Um, when I when I think about uh, networks, I I I think um, more in terms of your campaign team actually, because your friends and acquaintances, be they work acquaintances or in those volunteer roles or maybe relate to any political action you've been taking, those uh, people can become your team. Um, and that you're having a good campaign team is so important to building momentum, particularly in the early days. Uh, and they'll also help you help carry you through those long days when they're coming to volunteer beside you. Um, it's so invigorating to know that other people are willing to put time in. So, you really do have to invest in your network uh, to help build your campaign team and your supporters. Um, so, um, so in my case, um, and it wasn't done uh, intentionally, but um, the uh, the school board had uh, put up a recommendation to close my old high school, um, which the trustees eventually agreed to do. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, myself as an alumnus and some of the parents of the current students and other uh, alumni, um, we, uh, we, we uh, created lawn signs and we protested and, um, and did all that, uh, you know, that delegated to the, to the board of trustees, asking them not to close it, went through the whole process. It was a year and a half, really, from start to finish. Um, and uh, although we were not successful, um, in the end, um, that network did end up being uh, the network that helped uh, carry me towards success. One member of the team uh, became my campaign manager. Uh, another member uh, did my communications. Another did my volunteer coordination. 
So I, uh, I probably couldn't, I probably, I don't know if I would have uh, won without that group. It would have been much harder. And so there, there's another example connecting back to volunteering where you know, that volunteer group can become your political network uh, over time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. One more question before we open it up and uh, Kristen will take care of the question session. So we know you're counselors. What do you do? As counselors, what's your job? I mean, walk us through what you do on a day-to-day -day basis and how does that affect, you know, little me? And uh, <laughs> I think Councillor yeah, Rory. Yeah, I, can, uh, I can let Rory take this one first. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Um, you know, sometimes I ask myself the same question. Um, what, like, because uh, every day is so different that it is very hard sometimes to encapsulate uh, your your list. Like the to do list can be all over the map. So um, let's just take uh, take today for example. Um, today we had the flag raising uh, for um, the campaign to end polio uh, this morning, and then I had um, a conservation Halton uh, board meeting. So I sit on the board there. Uh, in the middle, I uh, I was on a conference call uh, discussing a Christmas market in uh, Burlington, a winter market in Burlington, and uh, you know, uh, in the middle of all that. Um, there were other <laughs> other various tasks. So that was today. And but I guess you could, to summarize very quickly, you there are two sides that I find. Um, one is your work, your official work when you're sitting in city council in the council chamber, uh, debating and discussing um, uh, reports and resolutions and and bylaws and moving the business of the city forward and making those important decisions. And then part of that is all the preparation that goes into it, all the reading of the reports, the talking to staff ahead of time, uh, deciding what your position will be, talking to the other counselors about their position, understanding uh, where you think it's going to go, debating whether you want to bring an amendment forth to change it or turn it down or defer it. All of that stuff is happening. Uh, and it's all building up. Usually for us, we have one and a half uh, weeks per month where we're sitting in, around the council table now virtually. And then the other half um, is community work. So that is working with your constituents on their individual issues and also being out in the community, raising flags, going to events, that sort of thing. So I'm probably forgetting things and some Eric can fill in some gaps for me. That was that was perfect. I, I have nothing left to say, but I can just say uh, one of the things that I have learned being a counselor is that I am also the manager of expectations. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also the triager of complaints. <laughs> and I'm also the builder of relationships. So anybody who calls me will not call me to say, hey, Samira, I just love how they remove the snow in my street. <laughs> no. <laughs> 99% of my calls that I will get and the emails I will get will be complaints and concerns. And that's what I'm here for. And it is the right to call their counselor because they elected me. And it is my job to be that bridge between the complaints that come from uh, residents and between staff. And our staff are regulated by provincial uh, bylaws uh, and rules. And so they can only perform within that frame. And so sometimes there are things that they cannot do because the bylaws or the official plans uh, don't allow it. And so my job then is to take that disappointing news and kind of package it nicely, wrap it, and give it to the resident, grab a coffee with them and talk to them and make them understand. So yeah, at, at some level, also the role of an educator because sometimes people just don't know, you know, they don't know. And once you talk to them and you let them know, these are the rules, um, this is what you should have done and you didn't do, and that's why you got this kind of fine or a ticket, they understand. Most people are understanding, but then you'll get one or two are really difficult people too, but that's the case for every field of work. So uh, just going to second everything Rory said, but this is the other angle of it. Uh, it's also a lot, uh, there's a big part of service delivery included in this role as well. 
Yeah, it's totally true. And uh, I just wanted to add, um, I try to think, you know, if, if you have 25,000 constituents and you get 10 upset emails in a week, then there must be 24,990 constituents who are not that upset. So there must be, you yep. know, some of them are surely satisfied. Um, so we talk yeah. to the positive spin on it. I should have added one more thing, which is that uh, we sit on a plethora of boards and committees outside of our regular duties, but as as in our role as counselors. And that's, you know, I sit on the Burlington Performing Arts Center board, which is how I was able to make a bridge uh, between your group and, uh, and them. Uh, I sit on the Conservation Halter board, that's why I was in the meeting today. Um, and, and on and on, there are many boards and, and other opportunities. Yeah. There, there are endless boards. It's up to you how much time you can carve out. Um, I like in in Milton specifically, our local town councilor position, which I which I hold, is a part time position. So uh, I I sit on many boards. I sit on the community fund board. I sit on the Milton uh, Library Board, the Milton Youth Task Force Committee, uh, which is the best committee on earth. And uh, <laughs> I get to I get to have a lot of fun with those teenagers, and uh, and many other small subcommittees that um, people will just put you on and you just show up. And you, because the good thing is you get to learn a lot. Be ready for lots of learning and lots of reading. <laughs> Hi, I have a question. Yeah, me There's a, there's a question from the 613 uh, number. Yes, please introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you, Evangela. Hello? Hi, caller from 613. You had a question? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Hi, uh, I, I think I had double muted myself accidentally earlier when you called callers to identify themselves. I apologize for that. Um, I have a question for both counselors. Um, my question is, what advice would you give to someone who's more of an introvert but interested in politics? Um, what advice can you give to someone like that? Okay, Especially someone from a different uh, cultural community. Do you mind yeah. introducing yourself, please? Uh, yes, my name is Nahma Qureshi, and um, I am soon moving to the Milton area. Uh, I'm currently in Ottawa, uh, but we're moving tomorrow, actually, to that area. And my question for both counselors is, what advice uh, would they give to someone who sees themselves uh, as an introvert, as opposed to an extrovert? What advice could they give uh, if that person um, is interested in engaging in politics in the future? And specifically if they're from a cultural community which is not uh, the mainstream uh, community uh, in politics. That's a great question, Nagma, and I, I thought I recognized you. <laughs> Welcome, Milton. <laughs> uh, we are very happy to have you from Ottawa. And your question is a great one. One thing I would say right off the bat is, um, you know, join a public speaking group uh, that will really, really help alleviate all of the, the you know, uh, the introvertedness and uh, it takes out it, it just challenges you in a way that you want you want, you kind of start enjoying public speaking and meeting people and talking to people because there there's group activities and stuff you can do to so try to find your local uh, toastmasters and join that I, I know a lot of politicians have done that they've done that my colleague counselor Zishan Hamid he had that issue and he discussed with me that he actually joined Toastmasters before he even decided to run for council. He uh, joined Toastmasters and uh, he dealt with the issue that way. So uh, just throwing his name out there too. I don't think he will like it, but hey, <laughs> what are friends for? <laughs> but uh, that's what he did. Other than that, yeah, you know, politics is a big lost um, um, you know, field. It's, it's a very big field. So it's not just running for office. There's many other positions you can you know be involved in and make a difference there's policy making there's uh working as a staffer uh working uh 
on different portfolios within the political arena, working on campaigns. So there's many other actually avenues of uh, getting your interest into politics uh, uh, fulfilled. So yeah, that's what I have to say. I, I think Rory can add more. Sure, thanks. Um, actually, I, I might throw it back to the uh, questionnaire for a little bit of clarity because my first question is, when you say that you're an introvert or you're referring to it the example of an introvert, um, I, I'm curious to know how that, how you would apply that to, um, to your engagement in, in politics. Or what, is it something that holds you back from possibly running for office? Or are you wondering how you can get engaged uh, without running for office? And then there's also the question about uh, minority communities, which is really the, you know, coming from a community that is not a usual um, political community. And I guess, um, you know, that's, uh, a, that's what the current office calls about, is how you can get uh, engaged and know your way through it. I do have some advice uh, for that. But first, if you don't mind, I would like to know what you're thinking about being an introvert and what that means. Oh, so the question's back to me. Sorry, the, the, your voice was a little bit unclear. Um, yeah. is, that, is that a question for me? Sure. So I think um, it was more of a general question, but if I were to consider going into politics in the future, and if I were to have be more on the introverted side, I think there's a lot of youth, for example, who who feel more introverted and I won't say shy, but a little bit hesitant to get involved in politics. I think one uh, challenge might be the networking aspect. How can they kind of network or learn how to network and be confident in networking with the right people uh, through volunteering? And the other aspect, I think, would be public speaking. Uh, not everyone is comfortable uh, perhaps speaking in front of an audience. And I think, uh, Samir, you gave a good uh, suggestion that, you know, there are organizations like Toastmasters, et cetera, who, can, who are specifically created just for that reason, so that young people and anyone really who's interested in politics can gain that uh, necessary confidence. Um, with respect to the second question about the larger community, I think there is a, a within a, many uh, ethno uh, cultural communities in Canada, um, there's a hesitancy still that exists among the uh, cultural communities to partake in mainstream politics. And there's many reasons for that. Um, uh, they could be personal experience they've had, uh, not feeling integrated in their local community. So if they don't feel integrated in, and uh, a part of the community, then it's very less likely that they'll want to engage in um, that community. Um, they don't feel represented. So I think there's various factors. Yeah, absolutely. You just answered all the questions. <laughs> yes, in a way. In a way. Uh, in a way. Can, I, um, can, I, can I make a follow up question? Okay, I just want to say find a mentor. You know, start with finding a mentor. Find a mentor uh, who, you, who you see represents you well, who you see you can link with and associate with. Find a mentor. And I think mentorship is so underrated, but it is huge. It makes a huge impact. I've had the pleasure and uh, the privilege of being connected to real good female leaders who I, on a constant basis, will call, talk to. One of them is Pam Damoff, um, the MP for Oakville, a most spectacular, stellar lady. And then, of course, uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing uh, Sue McFadden in Mississauga. So I've been I've been lucky in that way, and I encourage you to Nagma to look out and scope out some mentors for yourself, and try to talk to them and see see what the advice. If I could just add on that as well, first of all, I would nominate Samira to be anybody's mentor. Um, but um, okay, so I wanted to mention about public speaking because I think that is a major fear that a lot of people have. Is that if the hearing's not good, I'm going to get a, get a microphone uh, or get a proper microphone in a second. But um, as a, uh, I, I know myself, like there was a point where I hadn't done much public speaking for a while, where I would get nervous just saying my name and my title going around the table, right? You're waiting, you're sweating your hands, right? I mean... Why? I don't know. But I think it has a lot to do with being out of practice 
or not speaking, having enough of it. I can tell you right now that if I stopped right now, stopped public speaking for six months, I wouldn't be able to do this call without copious notes. Uh, I'd probably have asked you in advance for the questions or something, you know, because when you get out of practice, it becomes very hard to speak off the cuff and to speak in front of other people. It, it, it is like a muscle. You have to keep exercising it and keep pushing yourself. So you've successfully uh, said your name around the table without getting nervous. Congrats. Okay. Raise your hand next time and say, and say what you think, you know, and then keep going from there. Uh, speak to a larger group. It can be Toastmasters. It can be one of the best ways I think to, pu to practice public speaking is actually in meetings like this one. Um, mm -hmm. be better in person, but we're not doing those right now. But come up with what question. Think about a question for that like half hour at the beginning of the of the of the Q and A, and then put your hand up first, and just get it over with. And you will be doing public speaking in front of potentially 100 people or more, but you'll only be doing it for a second, right? And that's a great way to get more comfortable with public speaking. Um, right. and yeah, I'll leave, it, I'll leave it there. I know Andrew has a follow-up. No, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Sorry, sorry. No, no yeah, yeah. worries, no worries. I could go on forever, which is not good. So, <laughs> no, thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Okay, my follow-up question. I, I actually want to build on this point. Uh, since we're talking about um, being introvert, being an introvert or not, but this is an, an another angle uh, um, around dealing with rejection. Because I, if I look at, I heard you, one of you say you knocked on fifteen thousand um, dollars. Um, if I mean, obviously you had to do a lot of door knocking, and I've seen candidates knock on my door, you know, and I generally, I say, I. I I, I look at when I see the way I feel or the way I react when I see salesmen or people knock on my door, and especially I'm in the if I'm in the middle of uh, something important, and I really get irritated, uh, you know, when people knock on my door. So, and I try to put myself in those shoes, in that, in your shoes now, and say, how would I face the rejection if it were me going to going around knocking on people's doors? How am I going to deal with such rejection? So can you just quickly, if it's possible, share your experience in on door knocking? Because uh, that's something that I dread, I'll be honest with you. I'm comfortable speaking in front of people, but I'm, I, I'm not sure whether I like to do this, um, um, <laughs> this aspect of door knocking. So can I just quickly add something before I get the counselors to talk? Um, I'm a salesperson. And yes, I'm in leadership now, but you see, for us to get one sale, one sale we have to talk to at least 10 people yes and one thing i've realized is that if you don't knock on those doors or you don't make those cold calls you never know which one is going to say yes and because of the experience i've had as a salesperson knowing that if somebody is knocking on my door it's got to be really really important to them i become more receptive to them it's not necessarily that i'm going to say yes or I'm going to say no and break their hearts, I can tell them maybe, or I'll think about it. But one thing I know is that we lose all the shots we fail to take. And I believe that's Wayne Gretzky. So yes, whether it's cold calls or whether it's knocking on doors, you just got to take it. Cold and calls, every, uh, no, every no takes you to a, a, a yes. It propels you to do better. So I'm going to, I think I heard Evangeline saying something. Yeah, no, I it's said, me can actually. I, I wanted to there. talk about the cold call. Yeah. Cold calls. Sorry, I I just wanted to just uh, clarify something. Cold calls are cold calls. I can cold calls. I can do one ten thousand for cold calls. I can deal with that. It's the it's the door knocking that I'm talking about. Uh, cold calls. I don't I don't see your face yeah. even if you reject me. Um, I'm a salesperson as well. But there's that part that I wanted to get. Yeah, uh, Andrew, can I chip yes. in there? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I have never done door knocking before, and I'm with you. I'm so afraid of rejection. Uh, last year, I planned to have um, youth empowerment, and everybody in the organization said no. Um, the youth will not come. Uh, our youth in our community, they're not going to come. And I said to them, um, if we only get one person, 
if we're able to only get impact one person that we would have done our job. And that was the focus that I had going in, just impact one person. And I'm saying that to say, um, when you set out, if, the, if this is your passion, just think about it like that because there's no magic with words. You're definitely gonna get rejection. You're gonna get people hopefully not slamming the door in front of you. But just think about one win. And for me, in that experience, we got a lot of people, you, young kids, sending thank you. This was helpful. And we're like, oh, my God, we didn't really expect that. We also got people saying that was worst of their time. I mean, teenagers saying that was worst of their time. But for me, I would say in that regard, just focus on getting one win. And that should do it. Why I'm on this topic uh, why we're talking about public speaking and all of that. Um, can I ask you, counselors, you know, do you have to know everything with regards to policies, legislatures? Because I feel those are the type of fear that we worry if you're new, um, if you're an immigrant, you're like, what do I know about Canada that I'm going to run for office? You know, uh, what stage of comfort level do you think we need to be before we make that big um, step forward? Thank you. May I start, Samira? <laughs> okay. Well, first, I think we better uh, talk about Andrew's question because uh, door knocking gets me really excited. And the policy question is a really good one too, Evangeline, thank you. Um, now, um, I could that question can be answered philosophically and practically. Phil, the, phil, the philosophical answer, Andrew, would be, uh, you know, uh, the old Taoist uh, saying that a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. You, the hardest door to knock on, and I know this from personal experience, is the first door. Because you're talk of you know, if you think, uh, well, you know, putting your hand up in a meeting is hard enough, but. Knocking on that door to a stranger is very intimidating the first time, and it is. But it's also a thrill. It's a it's a thrill a minute, especially those first few days, when you have no idea what you're going to get into, and then after. Did we just lose him? Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. 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 Well, I Hi guys, sorry. Is. Yeah, okay. there he is. Here. I thought my internet was bad. Yeah. Please go ahead. <laughs> okay, shall I try again? I'm gonna turn off my camera just for a second. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so the knocking on that first door is the hardest door. It gets easier after that. Eventually it becomes repetitive. Uh, because you'll have heard it all within a few weeks. Yeah. Um, you know, you'll have no surprises. The only surprise I had uh, for the last little while was getting bitten by a dog on the last day. Oh. Um, so that was surprising. But um, here's another, another way to look at it. If you're the candidate knocking on their door, they will be very happy to hear from you. That is yeah. true. That's true. That is true. And I would like to concur what Rory said. The first door is the hardest one. And which is why I always say, and I keep saying volunteering, volunteer with campaigns. When you volunteer with campaigns, you go knock doors for other candidates. That's your training field. You're learning how to talk to people, how to memorize that script at the door, what kind of qu questions could be thrown at you, how to deal with those questions. That is your training field. So that's why I always say to everybody, don't just jump into it. Give yourself years of practice, volunteer with candidates. Uh, and that's how you learn. And uh, for sure, like Rory said, the first door is hardest. But in one or two weeks, you'll become a machine. And you will love it so much. And then people will have to stop you and say, stop. You're always away knocking on doors. Come back home. <laughs> But it gets so exciting. It gets so exciting because, you know, people start talking to each other. As you're knocking on doors, street by street, people are also talking to each other. 
And now when you go to the fifth street, they, people already know that you're out about knocking on doors. They're expecting you. So there's not that much resentment. But then there's there's also going to be some difficult doors. Not going to lie. It's not easy. I'm not going to make anybody think here that it's an easy thing to do. You are going to get over the difficulty of it. And you're going to start loving it. But it is not easy. It's a hard thing to do. It's a lot of effort, energy. And that's why coming back to what Rory said about, you know, having a strong team matters. Because, you know, you and your team can knock together as well. And I had one door. Uh, where I, the door was slammed on my face because I was a Muslim woman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had a lot of doors uh, slammed in my face as well. <laughs> um, for for whatever reason, people having bad days, just uh, angry yeah. people. Uh, what I was trying to say, hopefully this works, uh, was when you're the candidate knocking on the door, people are actually more likely to be very impressed Yes. Or some will even be honored that you're knocking on their door yourself. You're right. Well, that is the other side of the coin. People, a lot of people will really respect you for putting your name out there. I got lots yeah. of positive feedback. Oh, uh, yes. But not during a pandemic. Out. No knocking doors in the pandemic. No. <laughs> that's, the, that's the counselor in me. No, okay. Yeah. Hope Thank, that you. Helps. So, Thank you so much for your perspective. You're welcome. Counselors. And the rest of the... Uh, the audience, thank you. Evangelist point. I think she raised another point. Um, I think he, she talked Samir, about. Do you want to? Do you want to try that one first? Thank you, Andrew. What was that? I sorry, I missed it. Yeah, I wondered. Um, you know, one of the things that hold people back is the knowledge about the mm. policies, policies, legislation, yes. and all that. So, do you? You know, what comfort level should you be at? before you proceed? Well, you should have a good understanding, for example, just taking uh, a, my counselor position, you should have a good understanding about financial terminology because budgeting is a huge part of your portfolio as a counselor. You should be able to understand what the capital expenses are and what the operationals are and what are the differences. And you obviously should be able to understand some legal terminologies that come in with the bylaw language. If you are someone who is a learner, who is dedicated, who commits to reading through the agenda, because there are some people who do not read the agenda and it shows. If you read the agenda, I am telling you that you will be well equipped to sit on council. And I don't think that you require degrees in policy making just to run for office for a counselor. You don't. Um, having said that, a lot of good politicians have been lawyers because uh, lawyers are used to reading thick documents, endless documents. So reading and uh, putting a lot of work into it for the first year, I think is good. So um, I'll add on to that too. Um, first of all, I think a good, you know, a good uh, thing to sort of test yourself is the concept of comfort level, because you're never going to be comfortable being a candidate, especially for the first time. It's not something. You, it's not. It's not about being comfortable. You're not going to be comfortable. Now you can always prepare. Um, I think that attending council meetings and uh, committee meetings is a great way to uh, prepare. You want to know the latest issues, um, and that will help form your initial platform. Um, but what really helps you uh, to uh, launch your platform is to knock on maybe 500 doors. You knock on 500 doors, and by that time, you're going to know the issues people care about. You will form some opinions about those issues. You'll have a great understanding of what matters to people, and you and you know on top of that, you add your own beliefs and what's important to you personally in your own community, and boom, you got a platform, and you'll have that before anybody else does, uh, because you start knocking on those doors first. Don't you don't need a fleshed out policy platform to knock on doors. You don't need a perfect uh, flyer to knock on doors. You need something with your name on it, and and. You can say, and this is what I did in the early days, you know, um, I'd like to hear your issues. I'm not ready yet to put out a platform because I want to hear from you first. And you'll get you'll get pretty smart, actually, through those conversations because yeah. people yeah. like to talk. People like to tell you what, what they think. 
Can I, can I ask you a question? On, sorry, Evangeline, you. go ahead. Yeah. You no, done? no, no, just saying thank you. <laughs> okay. I, I, I have a follow-up question on that, um, especially now that you talked about not having a, you know, not having a platform, that you're not ready. But do you, as counselors, do you need to have a political platform or have any political leaning? Or uh, do you have to, like, belong to a liberal party or conservative to contest for councillors i know they they, they they vote for you individually but you need to have a political affiliation uh so the the councillor position or all munis municipal positions are non-partisan so it's just you mm -hmm. uh, uh you're the party it's just you okay just yeah. you okay so okay. i would just add to that um you know, uh, some people think that if you know they sh that they should represent a certain color or that sort of thing, even if it's behind the scenes. The short answer is no. There's no okay. need to do that. Um, you do need to be comf get comfortable with some of the issues. So, what are the issues that people care about the most? And that's an iter iterative process. You knock on a few doors. You hear from people. You do some research. Maybe you ask some questions at city hall. That helps to form your your thinking. And you take that and you and you start road testing it uh, back right. out for people. Um, one of my, uh, well, frankly, the most successful uh, part of my platform was a call for a splash pad in my ward. Wow. Okay. And that started with one person when I spoke to her at her doorstep. She said, we really need a splash pad around here. I, it takes me so long to walk to the nearest splash pad. I have to put my kids in the car. I have to load them up. I have to load everything. I have to go there, and then it's and then I have to repeat the process. Sometimes the kids only want to be there for five minutes. This is so frustrating. Now it was actually just one person who started with that, and then I started asking around, and people thought, "Wow, that is a great idea," you know, and that's that's what developed. And the uh, the splash pad is being constructed presently. Um, so that yay, yeah. <laughs> well I, I will be there. Oh. Yay! Well, well that's done. awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. yeah. That's a great answer, uh, Rory. That reminds me of uh, the platform I ran on. There is was a proposal to build a medical office building in the middle of a park in my ward, and I was part of the advocacy action group that was against that development. It was called the Sunny Mount Park Group, and um, I was actively advocating against that medical office building with my neighbors. Um, and um, I put that on my flyer as well, that, you know, I'm going to advocate hard against that medical office building. Uh, and that was one of the first things I brought to council when I got in elected. And it's not been built yet, two years. Uh, Adit Shala, sorry, let me just chim in. Uh, first of all, I'm going to be leaving at 7.30, everybody, and I apologize I have another um, meeting. Um, and Councillor Samari, let me thank you um, so much for coming and all your comments, same with Tari. But I want to ask you, um, um, I, um, I don't know if I should say support or help. Uh, one of the missions that ACCH that we want to take on is breaking that barriers when it comes to the Canadian experience. And when you mention that, I'm like, okay, I'm not gonna leave without saying to you, uh, we have one <laughs> ask if you can perhaps start working on that. And I do understand what you said about volunteering and the need for us to do that. And I'm sure that we will continue to look for ways that we can do that. Um, but we also have to also look at ways to start breaking down that bottleneck um, because it is a bottleneck and it's holding yes. back a whole lot of immigrants, uh, yes. whether we volunteer experience or not. Um, so it's more of a statement than, an, uh, than a question. So thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Evangeline. Thank you so much. Christine, do you have any questions you want to ask or does anybody have any questions? Yeah, sure. So one of the questions would be, um, so are you a town or regional counselor uh, to both, both counselors? And if you can kind of give us an example of the difference between the two. I'm a, I'm a town counselor and Rory is both, right? 
correct? Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a city and a regional. Yeah, and then I, I guess Rory is the better person to answer the question. Sure, yeah, no worries. Um, well, uh, one part of it is one it comes with a full-time paycheck and the other one comes with a part-time paycheck. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is which is, there's an irony here and it's it's pretty well understood that most of your work will actually happen at the city or town level versus the regional level at least that's how it works in halton region um so there's a bit of an inequity there that that could be uh repaired in the future um so um I'll, to make a long story short um the uh the region uh has some of our larger roads is responsible for some of our larger roads it's responsible for your water, very important responsibility, and your sanitation, very important responsibility. It's important. It's responsible for a lot of the social programs, mo many of which are funded by the province but are delivered by the region. That includes community housing, uh, mental health uh, supports, uh, being two examples. So those are a few things the region does. The city, um, the city takes care of. Pretty much everything else, like um, the this, uh, most of the streets are covered by the city. Oh, the the region does your uh, does your uh, garbage and recycling, of course, right? You see the Halton region trucks going around. Um, the city does your community centers. It does most of the parks. The region does have responsibility for a couple parks, but most of your parks um, as well. Uh, gosh, it's a long list, uh, and I'm I'm like. I'm drawing short here. Snow, snow, snow removal. Oh, snow, yeah, removal. snow removal. Building applications. Oh, um, yeah. So both both of them do building applications. It's a it's a yeah. strange thing, but most of yeah. the responsibility goes to the city, and both yeah. of them work together on planning the city and the and the future growth of that city and how it grows. Yeah. yeah. So that gives you an idea, hopefully. Yeah, and all of your parking issues, your parking tickets, all of this, are my fun things to do. <laughs> Perfect, budget, great example. You know, Thank you. When I when I added up the budget of both, as and I added in also some of the other uh, boards that I sit on that are related to the region, it's it's about uh, like very rough ballpark, one point four billion dollars per year. It's an incredible amount of money, actually. Uh, and we are the fastest growing region in the country, and Milton's the fastest growing municipality um, in the country. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, There's another question. Just one more. <laughs> so uh, some people may say that you are lawmakers. Uh, is that part of the mandate? And is that true? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. We are. We're. Uh, I think we could say we're bylaw makers. Yes, bylaw makers. I was going to say that we can make amendments to bylaws, or we can bring forward motions that turn into bylaws. So. So um, and and the bylaws are are legal in force and um, are governed by provincial legislation. Provincial, yes. Yeah, specifically the municipal act. Yes. But um, you know, uh, it's very commonly said that um, that municipalities are the children of the province in Canada. Yes. That is how our constitution lays it out. Uh, municipalities don't have um, uh, sovereign authority. Um, so they must work with the province and conform to provincial regulation. That's how it works uh, for us in Canada. Yeah. Okay. And sorry, one last question. Um, what's the life cycle of a councillor? So do you, you do you have to re get reelected every year? Is it a couple Four of years? years? Four years. Okay. So the same as, okay. All and my right. predecessor was there for 30 years. Wow. Um, yeah, it's a long time. <laughs> um, and uh, so, yes, um, the truth, the truth of the matter is that once you are elected, you'll have a great chance of reelection if you do it, if you do a good job. Great chance. Because you yes. do tons of people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why when there's an open seat, so many people will, will run for it as a matter of strategy. Uh, I personally... Uh, preferred an open seat um, to one that wasn't. And that was a big reason why I ran uh, where I did run. 
So as a matter of strategy, open seats are, are a really fair game. On the other hand, um, so speaking on strategy, if you feel that a counselor is not a great campaigner, maybe isn't very well liked, that can also uh, be very doable. Because uh, you know an open seat will gather many people. And so you're, you're going to be in the mix with a lot of people. So that's, you know, something to keep in mind. But a popular yes. counselor or even like a, a, a decent counselor is very hard. A visible to counselor? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Visibility is huge. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Great. if you Thank have you. an area counselor who shows up at every event, is active, has a good reputation, um, is a very good public speaker, it's going to be hard. Uh, but if, like Rory said, if it's an open seat, a new word that was created, that's fair game for everyone. Um, I'll say in Burlington, um, in the last council, at the last council, two um, two councilors were hired, yes, and were and they endorsed candidates who were not elected. Um, I, I won despite the uh, person who was retiring endorsing my main competitor. Wow. Um, one person one person was re-elected as councillor one councillor ran for mayor and beat the mayor so the mayor lost the last election there as well and then two councillors were defeated outright uh, yeah. by by new people so it just shows how much change that can that's out of seven that's all of them yeah, so right when there's a change election and you can represent the change um you could have a great chance that was and, brampton too right with patrick brown yeah exactly yeah. Exactly. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Excellent. You're welcome. So do we have um, any other questions from um, people in I'm just checking to see if there's any others. I don't see any other questions in the Q&A. Oh, wait, there's one. Oh, no, that was a chat. So far, uh, no other ones yet in the uh, Q&A panel. Awesome. Any Does anybody want to ask uh, personal questions? Okay, Mr. Abe Salami, I'm going to put you forward. You've been very quiet. <laughs> Do you want to ask any questions of these five people before they go? <laughs> no, no, I just, I just, I just don't want to. Mm. I don't want to <laughs> no, I just don't want to force any question, but I, you know, I said earlier, I, Frankly, no, I mean, politics in Nigeria is quite different from here, but basically we all, you know, um, operating on the same democratic way of governance, right? But um, when you engage in politics in Nigeria and listening to how you're doing things here is kind of quite different, you know? So <laughs> here uh, <laughs> you need to participate, you need to, Fully participate, and you need to um, you need to be known. As you said, you can you have to like knock the door, knock on the doors, you know, volunteer and do things that people will see and say, okay, uh, why can't you just? They will even suggest to you, like why can't you run for the office? But uh, the reverse is contrary in uh, in Nigeria that you know the party system. You need to like you know. Uh, I think uh, comparing apples and oranges, you know, so um, uh, my question is, is not a question, it's like a statement, right? Um, is that a particular um, way when you want to run for office, especially like from counselorship or you have to start like from way up or you can just say, okay, I'm interested to be the mayor, so can I just go run and what is the process? You are, you have to um, uh, join a political party, or you can do that independently as a um, councillorship position. Oh well, um, no, you do not need to join a party to run municipally, and that's the beauty of running municipally. It's also the beauty of being a councillor because you you actually make all your decisions yourself. You do not answer to anybody else when you're a councillor. There's nobody telling you how to vote on anything. Uh, and no. that's not the case provincially and federally. So if you want to no. talk provincial and federal politics, yes, you do need to run for a party uh, to, to have any chance of being elected. Yes, you do need to get to know the people in the know to an extent, to an extent. Mm -hmm. um, it, it certainly helps. 
you need to get involved with your party and take all that volunteer discussion we had and throw that volunteerism into that party and support the party and Mm -hmm. support the leader and get, you know, get, get things going that way. All that will help you. Um, You can run for a nomination from scratch and you can win that nomination. It is doable. It's not who you know that matters, but it is easier. (laughs) The more people, you know, the easier it will be. And again, those people will, you'll eventually ask, tap those shoulders and ask them to come knock on doors with you. And will they say yes or no, right, um, is the question. But um, you can run, you know, most most people who are uh, counselors, many of them lost their first time. Um, the mayor of Burlington lost her first two elections before she won. Uh, just as an example, and she's won three since then. I lo- I lost my first nomination race before I won municipally, and I like to call that winning by losing. So you lost the election, but you won in the experience that you gained to help you win the next time around. You won, and of course, and all the nice things, the people you meet, the it's a it's it is running for office is an amazing experience, whether you win or lose. Um, but it's more fun when you win. Um, but losing your first election, there is no harm in that whatsoever. Um, and hopefully you are enthused and encouraged by that to run again. Um, so that's winning. That's the winning by losing uh, strategy. But I would say if someone really wants to run, they should just get in there. Just just get in there. Um, that is That first one, no one will ever fault you and no one will ever think you, you know, no one will ever look at you badly for having tried that for, especially that first time around. Uh, that doesn't take away from all the other advice we've been giving about get, getting set up to win. But uh, yeah, you can just, especially municipally, you can jump in there for sure. I've seen cases where people jumped in at the last minute and almost, and I've almost won beating an incumbent. They signed up on the last day. I've seen others where they came from nowhere um i'm trying to think of any who came from nowhere and won it all i know they're out there so yes it is possible it is possible thank you very much mr akikumi do you mind chipping in please uh good evening everyone good evening yeah so uh a lot of people have said a lot today and um Really appreciate. Thank you to Councillor Rory, Councillor Samir Ali. We thank you for uh, coming here today to uh, share your ideas with us. Do one of the things I would like to ask. Uh, some of the questions I would like to ask have been asked, like you know, being an introvert. Uh, I believe uh, public speaking, then engaging yourself in uh, po- uh, volunteering uh, public roles. Right, will help you uh, to be able to uh, speak up, face the crowd, and uh, um, also they also like um, answer the question I was going to ask as well when they asked that when um, Councillor Rory said uh, uh, some uh, councillor on on full time payroll, while some are on part time payroll, because I really want to ask like, do you guys do this as your as a full time job? Or do you have some other things you do by the side? So that's the question, right? Or do you like just do this as a full time job, or do you have something else to do by the side? Apart from so, being a counselor uh-huh. or. No, thank you for that question. And uh, so, like in Milton, the local counselor, town counselor position is a part time position. But in the end, it is not a part-time position in real time. If you look at all the all the work that needs to be done to perform, uh, you know, to, to your own satisfaction, because you want to make sure that every complaint you get, every concern you get, every question you get is re- responded to within 24 hours. In Milton, we don't even have any staff. So all counselors are on their own managing all of the emails and text messages and calls on their own. So I actually do a full-time job, uh, but I am, I'm i in a part-time role. And I, until December last year, I was actually doing my full-time job and this job together. And it just wasn't working out for me. 
I have four young kids as well. So it was just crazy for us. And so I just gave up my other job and now I just focus on my counselor work. Okay. So um, the, uh, yes, I, I mean, first of all, I, I, let's, I'll be totally transparent. So the city part of my job pays around $50,000, $54,000. And the regional part pays about the same. Okay, so it's not even if you if you are a, a town councillor, it's it's not minimum wage. I mean, there there's there is some there is some pay there. Let's be honest. Uh, I get thirty nine thousand dollars. Thirty nine? Oh my gosh! You guys need to fix that. Um, so, but there is a wage there, right? There is a there is a wage. Now, uh, by the way, school board trustee can be a great way to dip your toes into politics. However, you will be paid a wage below minimum wage when you count all the hours you put into that. I think it's probably $5 an hour because they're, the number of meetings and all that, uh, the amount of work you put in, and they, they give you like $12,000 or something. It's ridiculous. And it's um, really important work too. Yeah, and, and the reason, long story short, trustees were supposed to just be advisors that would meet occasionally and sort of rubber stamp documents or you know ask a question here and there, kind of like a high level board but that that has changed a lot over the years but the pay has not <laughs> now uh, so as a regional and town or regional city councilor myself it is it is you do not have it does not have to be a full-time job however it does pay you enough for you to make a living a solid living um, and to do it full-time I would not have run for office if I if I could not have, because I was in the federal public service, and so um, you know cutting my paycheck in half would not have been an option for me. So um, thank goodness that that we have that option now. Burlington has uh, half as many councillors as the other um, towns uh, because we shrunk our council, and it, that's a barrier because at least in Milton you can run for town councillor first and then potentially work your way up. So there's some progression there, some promotional opportunity. You know, in Burlington, it's a big gap to run and, and be elected at the region. So, you know, you have to work twice as hard to get there because more people want the job because it pays more. Um, and it's a, it's a smaller and more powerful uh, group, essentially. Does that answer your question, uh, Ekinkumi? Yes. Answer my question. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I do see someone with um, Nigerian Association. I don't see a name. Do you mind uh, pitching in to what we're talking about? Hello, uh, Nigerian Association. Are you there? Okay, so while we wait, uh, is there any additional questions from anybody else? I have a question from all of you. Sure, go right ahead. <laughs> please, in please let me know about uh, uh, about your uh, African Caribbean Council. I know that there's few of you who are from Nigeria, but what other nationalities are included in this group? I would love to learn about that. Okay, so I guess I'm gonna be the best person to answer that. So African Caribbean, as the name sounds, is actually for people of African descent and Caribbean people. So it's, it's open for everybody. Uh, we have a platform that is close to 100. So it's a platform that was opened shortly before February 2020. You will remember me, I believe, during the Black History Month. That was something that was orchestrated by myself. And so it was after the Black History Month that we decided, come on, guys, let's come together. Let's talk together. Let's move well it done. beyond uh, February, February, because remember, it is true that Black History Month is celebrated in February, but whether we like it or not, we remain black. And I don't like using the word black. Everybody that knows me knows I don't like using that. Our color does not change 365 days a year. So if our colors does not change, why are we not having that dialogue? Why are we not talking to ourselves? Why are we not moving ourselves forward in the Alton region? 
Mm. So African Caribbean Council of Alton represents people from all the cities. Evangeline lives in um, Oakville. We have people on our committees in, from Burlington, from Alton uh, Hills. Um, we have, um, you know, we represent all the all the cities and the towns. So okay. uh, on our platform, we have a lot of people. The point is, there's a lot of things going on. And when we started, uh, we did um, we did uh, spend one minute silence for uh, people for what's happening in Nigeria. There's a lot of candle lit services going on right now. And it's not just Nigerians attending them, but we have other people from other uh, African nations and uh, the Caribbeans attending them. I, actually, I belong to another association that is having an, a, a prayer night every night mm -hmm. just for what's happening in Nigeria because it's really, really brutal. So there's a lot, you, you saw a lot of people dropping up because they need to be in other meetings. And a lot of people are not able to join because actually in Brampton today, there's a candlelight happening around Iron 7 tonight. So all over Canada, there's something going on because of that. So a lot of people are involved. So to your point, we represent the people of Alton, people that, um, that associate with being exotic, African Caribbean. I call myself exotic <laughs> because I'm not black, right? Uh, so it's all about continuing the conversation. And after we did the uh, Black History Month, uh, we were supposed to meet and tell our stories because believe you me, we all come from different cultures. We want to understand ourselves because again, if we're saying we want allies like yourselves to support us, allies like yourself to understand us. We need to understand where we're coming from. So let me give you an example. Nigeria, for instance, has over 250 ethnic groups, meaning over 250 languages. Okay. Wow, thank you so much. Somebody from, so somebody from Korea, if they don't talk to us, how would they know who we are? So we need to Absolutely. So the idea is we want to learn from ourselves. We want to know how we can support ourselves. We want to know how we can build ourselves up. And I love the question that um, I've forgotten the name of uh, the lady that is talking from Ottawa. The idea is to network, empower ourselves. We've done a few programs. We've actually done a program for our children because part of the things we do is youth empowerment. We did coding session for them. Uh, they're already asking for financial literacy. So whatever we can do, they're asking for French as second language. Whatever we can do to empower is what we want to do. Whether it's professionally, whether it's understanding the social norms. You talked about volunteer. I believe so much in volunteering because I know that volunteer takes you to the next level. It helps you to be confident. I didn't used to be able to talk like this. No, it's practice. Practice makes perfect, period. My little boy spoke to me one of those days and said, oh, mom, I don't like talking in front of people. And I had to make him understand that once upon a time, I used to be like that. My son sees me as a superhuman being. He could not believe that I would be shy to talk to people. And I told him that when I started talking to people, I would look over their heads. I would look over their heads and I'll say whatever I need to say and I'll get out of it. But eventually, when you look at people's faces, because they know what you're doing is important they know that if there were the other people standing up stage, they will feel right too they'll smile to encourage you and so you gain strength from the smile and the nodding of people when you're speaking in public you get better so when we did the black history month we were supposed to continue the storytelling but covid eat and when covid eat it just shut down everybody everything because nobody knew where it was gonna take us and then George Floyd happened. And we knew that yes, COVID has it, but George Floyd has opened her mouth. We need to speak up. We need to continue the conversation. We don't know when yes. it's gonna end just as we are. Now we're going through a second wave, kind of. So we needed to continue the conversation. And so we got ourselves together and we had a town hall where we invited MPs, MPPs, mayors. They were, and that was the first time I met uh, Councillor Rory Neeson. So we had a conversation about inclusiveness because again, Evangeline talked about it. Most of us feel invincible. What it would take somebody from another culture will take us triple, 
and we have to be overqualified for that matter. So I have two degrees and one MBA and a professional qualification. If I had that and I was Caucasian, believe you me, I'm sure I'm going to be CEO of my bank right now. Just by, for the mere fact of the skill set I bring to bear and my qualification. But that's not the case for us. We, we continue to struggle, we continue to labor, we continue to add to our skills. And then we hear, oh, you're overqualified, or oh, you don't have Canadian experience. And that's why we want the dialogue to continue. And who can talk about us but us? And when we talk about us, we're happy to know that, yes, we have people that are listening because people have shown a lot of compassion, a lot of care, a lot of empathy, because that, that's the starting point. And so when we talk, so, so ACCH is all about making that change happen. But again, we know that the cameras will stop. We know all these fun things will stop because right now it's actually, it's great to be exotic or black as people would say, because everybody is listening. But when they do stop listening, who is speaking for us? Us needs to speak for us. We need to advocate. And that's why Christine mentioned what her vision is. We want to advocate, we want to build, we want to empower ourselves. And we want to continue the conversation, we want to continue the dialogue that people like you will listen to what we're talking about and we can continue building from there so that we will stop being invisible. I'll share another story. Have you ever been told, and I'm not sure, but in our culture, it's so, so easy for our children to be told you can't do this. In the school system, they'll tell them, no, you can't do academics. No, it's not meant for you. It happened to my son. Yeah. You know, it happened to a lot of us. People tell us you can't. Why is it that people start with you can't? We want I heard to that about the field school system, you're right. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. not only do we want to impact um, education, because even in, 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 in during education, uh, uh, I mean, in our schools, they will bring the worst of stories to our children and that will make our children cry their eyes out just because they're hearing negative things about themselves. And that shouldn't be the case. So we want to advocate for our youth. We want to advocate, advocate for our professionals. We want to advocate for ourselves. We want to advocate for our now and our future. And how best to do it than having a platform and making sure that we continue the dialogue making sure that we are heard so that we stop being invisible. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And I know that, oh, it's Funke Yutayo. Funke Yutayo, please, over to you. Nigeria Association. <laughs> oh, I said what I wanted to say already. Good evening, oh. everyone. Yeah, I just said, um, uh, I was I haven't used this platform before, so I was trying to unmute myself unsuccessfully for like one minute. And then when I finally was able to, it had passed my my uh, window to speak. So um well I I have been enjoying the meeting so far. It's um it's quite an eye opener. Thank you all for setting this up and thank you to the counselors for coming in and um talking to us and educating us. I have learned quite a lot. And um, I think that's basically it. No questions. Just thank you for the education. Thank you very much. And I do see uh, Mr. Solomon Edegwe joined. Uh, do you want to chip in uh, into the conversation? We have just about six minutes to, to round up. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I joined late, but uh, yeah, always. Uh, you know, um, and, you know, uh, uh, a pleasure to join in this kind of conversation. I know that it's uh, paramount that we're involved, you know, as you know, as a community, you know, and as a group, you know, to see that uh, we have uh, effective governance in our in our society. And as we are, we are passionate people. We 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 like to work with other community to see that the community prosper as a group. And uh, we are thankful that. You know, uh, we have our counselors coming in to have a chat with us in this uh, regard. Uh, thank you for joining us to, uh, this evening, and really appreciate you know your your comments and 
uh, are your are your perspective in these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you so <coughs> much. And uh, Christine did not say her background. She's actually fifty eight uh, Caucasian and uh, fifty two West African, and the all the rest of the world. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> my dad is actually a Nova Scotian, and her mom is Scottish. Do you want to talk about your heritage a little bit before we move on? Sure. Yes. Um, yeah, thanks to 23andMe, I, I was able to find out what uh, my complete background and my making makeup is. Uh, so I'm Canadian. My mother is Scottish and English. My father was born in Nova Scotia. He is um, Spanish Guyanese. However, based on <laughs> the DNA testing, I'm 17% Nigerian. And uh, yeah, I've just got a, a very uh, wide range of beautiful um, ethnicities across the across the globe from European to African South African um, South American it's crazy but yes that's me <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for sharing just one last thing before I get Mr. Abis allow me to do the vote of thanks uh, as Evangeline mentioned and uh, Councillor Rorinisa knows about this one of the things that we want to have an impact on is the idea of new immigrants coming in as permanent residents. We know that when you come in as a permanent resident, you've gone through a lot of, <coughs> a lot of uh, testing or whatever you call it. It's a point system. They look at your education, they look at your experience, they look at your skill set, and then they tell you, congratulations, you can come to Canada as a permanent resident. And you're here feeling that you've landed, but you end up realizing that you're actually grounded. And even up until three days ago, I was talking to a colleague, a younger colleague. This is somebody that's been more like an EVP in his country, is hired as a teller in the bank. And he said, I have high hopes when I was coming. And this is not actually somebody from my community. It's from the Indian community. He said, I have high hopes when I came to Canada, but Canada has a different um, experience for you. So one of the things we want to impact is Yes, we understand the importance of having Canadian experience. But the point is you said we're okay to come. How can we now kind of accelerate that process so that it doesn't turn to mental health? A lot of people are underemployed. A lot of people are not even employed at all. And so, yes, they are losing. And they feel sense of worthlessness. And they feel sense of lack of inclusiveness. And so what can we do to kind of accelerate that process for them to get the experience they need to get, but at a faster level, not starting from scratch. So that's something ACCH is trying to work on uh, and make that impact. Two minutes to eight. We have two minutes. Any last words from Councillor Rory Nissen, 30 seconds, and Councillor Samira Ali, and then we'll get um, a vote of thanks. Excellent. Uh, well, um, thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a, I really feel that it's an honor that you would uh, invite me uh, and me and my background uh, into your um, discussions. Um, and I will, I'm happy to be here for you anytime that you need me. So. I consider it an honor that you would uh, that you would uh, have me here. So thank you very much. As far as the theme of the night, um, if I could sum it up, um, you know, I would say believe in your believe in yourself when it comes to politics. Yes, it is doable. Expect a lot from yourself. Expect yourself to be successful and to do the hard work. Don't be afraid to ask for help for real help of people. Ask them, will they help you? Will they support your campaign? Will they knock on doors for you? Never be afraid to ask. And don't be afraid to ask for advice. Don't ever be afraid to ask for advice. It's free and it's it's worth a lot. And uh, I'll be happy to help any way I can with any future um, candidates uh, in our region. Thank you, Lady Abba. <laughs> Thank you so much. Over to you, Councillor Ali. Thank you so much. Uh, again, I just wanted to uh, further what Councillor Brory Nissan said. 
Thank you for having us over and sharing your passion with us and giving us the opportunity to connect with the uh, African Caribbean Council of Halton. I, I feel like all of you are my friends now and I know all of you and I, I love, you know, putting the name to the face, uh, the, the faces to the names and, uh, and learning about uh, the purpose of why you're doing this. And I just want you to know that in me, you have a very strong ally, a friend, uh, you know, because a lot of my lived experiences are very similar to your experiences as an immigrant, as a woman of color. I, I cannot say, I cannot dare say that they're the same, but they are similar. So from that, I just want you to know that, like Rory said, I'm here to help anybody, especially the ladies, because, you know, girl power. <laughs> to uh you know just i've shared my email address reach out call me anytime and I'd love to talk and see how i can be a productive part of your council you know in what way i can be part of if you have any mentorship programs for your youth um let me know i'm part of the milton youth task force so if you would like to come and talk to my, our youth task force and share about your vision, let me know how I can facilitate that. And uh, like I said, I have a strong ally and uh, happy to work with you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> one, we want to make them professionalism. And so Musabi Salami, over to you for vote of thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Lady Abba. Um, once again, my name is Abi Salami, um, one of the board members of ACCH and um, the finance lead. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the informative session given today by our able counselors. Uh, it is my honor and privilege now to give a vote of thanks to all those who helped make this event happen. Thank you so much. Uh, we will not be enlightened about governance and way forward in our society without great appearance of our counselors. So first and foremost, uh, I'd like to thank the ACCH for giving this opportunity to gather today. Um, I'd like to thank Councillor Rory Nissen and Councillor Samira Ali for enormous gift of their knowledge base in how any interested person can be in the League of Leadership in our political system. Something that really struck me was when Samira said to start by volunteering and work your way up. It's very, very important, especially for somebody like me that I engage in politics in Nigeria as well. Thank you so much. And again, um, the public speaking techniques and confidence techniques style by Rory is very helpful, especially again for someone like me who earns my living by making sales. Because if I don't talk, I, I can eat. Um, I would like to thank everyone for participating in this series here tonight. I'm so grateful for this opportunity. And as a matter of fact, this is one of our aims and objectives at ACCH to bridge the gap and coexist peacefully and make our community better. So at this notion, I say thank you, thank you, thank you. And we do more of this. Thank you so much. That's recall. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> Bon <Bonnie. laughs> nuit. Au revoir. Au revoir. Good night. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Bye -bye. everybody. Good, Good night. night everyone. Thank you. Good night. Yeah. Au revoir à tous. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.